Okay, so good morning and uh, let's get on with the subject matter of the course. Today what we are going to do is look into a couple of examples of signal processing algorithms to try and understand some of their computational characteristics and also look at a few architectures. What I mean by architectures is sort of ready pre-existing architectures and try and understand what kind of computational capabilities can be handled by those architectures and whether they are a suitable fit for the kind of applications that we are looking at. So a lot of what I'm going to do today is some sort of uh, very quick uh, back of the envelope calculations so to say, right? And part of the reason for doing this is that I think it's good practice to uh, understand how to do those things quickly, right? You don't need to have very accurate numbers, but you at least need to know what what sometimes called ballpark figures, right? Order of magnitude. Am I at least in the right? Am I using roughly the right kind of architecture for solving a given problem, or is there absolutely no chance that my given architecture will be able to solve it? Or on the other hand, is it just overkill, right? I mean, is my compute requirement so low that I'm using something which is much more than what I need? So all of those are relevant and important questions when you are trying to come up with a useful mapping of a given algorithm to whatever architecture you have available to you. So we'll start basically by defining a few metrics. What I mean by metrics is some kind of numbers that are typically mentioned when we talk about how effective is this uh, computation or what kind of uh, compute requirements are there. Okay. And then we look at three different problems and very approximately try and estimate their computational requirements. Okay. After which we will look at a few different architectures that exist and again try and estimate what are their computational capabilities and you know sort of just to get an idea of what fits with what. All right. To start with a quick overview of metrics, it's just this one high level slide overview that I'm giving over here. There are a few different sets of numbers that you will often see mentioned in the context of how to qualify or measure the quality of a given architecture or an algorithm. One of the things that keeps coming up is the data transfer rate or the communication rate, right? And this is typically the number of bits that can be transferred over a wire or a bus per unit time. Okay. So an example of this is, let's say that in fact we are using a microphone and we are trying to record samples of audio, then ultimately that microphone is basically being connected by one wire to your A to D converter and the A to D converter then has to basically pick up the data, convert it into a digital format and then transmit it somehow. That transmission could either be over a serial bus or over some kind of a parallel 8 bit wide interface. All of those ultimately translate into number of bits that can be transferred per unit time. Okay, The typical units for this are megabits per second, gigabits per second, you could have kilobits per second but nowadays we are obviously as far as this course is concerned we are more interested in the high end of computation, right? the more compute intensive problems. right? So most of the time we'll be talking about megabits per second or gigabits per second. Having said that there are applications, usually low power applications where your data rates are low and then we'll talk, be talking about kilobits per second or possibly even just bits per second. right? The next thing after the raw data rate, how am I transferring information around comes to operations. right? What kind of operations am I performing on the data that I have available to me? The most common in the realm of signal processing turns out to be something called the multiply accumulate operation which is basically multiplying two numbers and adding it to something else. Okay, So usually what happens is you have one register, you can think of it as a variable which has some data that has already been accumulated over time. You have two other values, usually something like an input sample and a weight or a coefficient. You multiply those two together and add them to whatever was already present in the register. That operation is called a multiply accumulate right? and is one of the most common operations in the domain of signal processing. So the number of multiply accumulates per second, typically m max, millions of multiply accumulates per second or g max, 
giga max billions of multiply accumulates per second are common metrics okay nowadays though and in fact not just nowadays it has historically even before the advent of dsp the most common metric in some ways was floating point operations okay now what exactly is a floating point number what are the properties of floating point numbers we'll be handling in a later class right because it is relevant to us we need to understand a bit more detail about why we want to use floating point where possible what are the advantages and drawbacks of it but for the time being one good way of thinking about it is floating point number is basically a real number okay it can have a fractional portion it can have an integer portion it can have a very wide dynamic range okay which is what basically sort of gives it a advantage over normal integers so the number of floating point operations per second is usually referred to as flops okay this value over here flops all caps when you see it with flops all caps it usually refers to floating point operations per second right there is also unfortunately one thing that you will see very often is just flop flop with possibly a small s at the end to indicate a plural right where the flop over here just basically means floating point operation so sometimes this can be a bit confusing you are likely to see both being used interchangeably and in fact i might also use them interchangeably not interchangeably but in the same sentence possibly but usually it's clear from context whether we mean just the number of operations or the number of operations per second okay so you need to sort of keep that in mind you understand it clearly are you talking about just the raw number of operations or the number of operations per second but the number of flops is essentially is uh, going to be a uh, our main metric for a lot of the computations that we are going to do later to find out whether or not what we are doing is computationally in what the requirements are okay mips is an slightly older and nowadays very rarely used term it basically stands for millions of instructions per second there is also another acronym for mips uh, or expansion for mips which is basically it's a name of a type of processor okay something with interlocked pipeline stages but uh, it doesn't really matter again from context it's usually very clear which one you are uh, referring to mips if we talk about mips in this course it is usually in the context of millions of instructions per second but like i said it's very rarely used nowadays so we will not be using it much and nowadays flops of course is very well known it's been around for decades people understand exactly what you mean by floating point operations and the number of floating point operations per second is a good measure not just in fact its use in the context of dsp and uh, neural networks is relatively recent it is typically used more in the context of really high performance computing right supercomputers where you are trying to measure the number of gigaflops or teraflops that a uh, machine is capable of nowadays with the advent or uh, advent of neural networks people have been finding that full blown floating point 32 bit floating point or 64 bit floating point is usually overkill for the kind of applications that we are dealing with so there have been a number of different kinds of variants of architectures that have come up you can still count the number of operations as the number of multiplications number of additions but it no longer really makes sense to talk of them as multiply accumulates or flops right because in some cases they might be an application of some kind of a nonlinear function in some cases it might be an approximate multiplication or an approximate addition so rather than worrying about what exactly it is people just call it ops per second the number of operations where the operation could be will be defined in the context of what you do okay so all of these are going to be useful metrics primarily we'll be focusing on flops but uh the others also could come up in certain contexts then of course comes the memory bandwidth right the number of bytes or words that are transferred per unit time i'm differentiating this slightly from the data transfer rate which is usually just for example the output of an atd converter which is being transferred into a machine in the case of memory bandwidth it might not be from an external sensor it might be that you are doing some computation your data needs to be fetched from memory acted upon and then pushed back into memory so what kind of memory bandwidth 
how quickly do you need to be able to read and write that memory to process it okay once again megabits per second gigabits per second is possible but usually megabytes per second gigabytes per second are more common because the assumption is that you are working with multi bit data and uh, memory bandwidths are more often described in terms of megabytes per second than megabits per second in some cases especially for dram and all that you will also see another term mtps which is the number of transactions per second or number of transfers per second okay the reason why this is different from megabytes per second is because then it starts depending on the width of the bus dram especially sometimes we now have very wide bandwidths right i could have the minimum would be an 8 bit bus but i could have a 32 bit bus a 64 bit bus and nowadays high high bandwidth memory has 1024 bit buses okay so this is an extreme opposite of the sort of serial bus transfer that we are talking about where we are saying that you know you actually have 1024 bit wide buses they are used only for very short distance communication just from one chip to another literally but you can get fantastic bandwidth in that way okay we'll look at that a little bit more moving forward okay so let's look at a couple of examples right and sort of see if we can dive a bit deeper into them one is audio processing okay so i'm basically going to consider input audio that's been sampled at 48 kilo samples per second and i'll say that this is basically 16 bit data okay and the operation that we are trying to do is filter it okay and i'm assuming it's a 30 tap filter so what does this actually mean it basically says something like this my input data if i look at this as the time axis can be thought of as a set of samples right so this could be thought of as my x of n i have some kind of a filter this would be the typical structure of a let's say a low pass filter use in order to eliminate some frequency components right i'm drawing it this way because typically low pass filters tend to be symmetric etc etc those are not properties we are particularly concerned with here all that we care about is we have some coefficients okay and the operation that we are trying to perform is essentially this from for k is equal to some zero up to n minus 1 where n is the number of taps okay so this is it this is the operation that we are trying to perform we take data multiply it with a set of coefficients add everything together and generate one output result okay one possible architecture for this looks roughly like this it basically says i have my input x of n coming here i'll put it through some kind of a delaying element okay this is typically a register with a clock so i have a set of registers like this okay now i need to take x of n and multiply it with in this case if i look at what would be the coefficient corresponding to x of n that would be h of 0 okay because k equal to 0 gives h of 0 into x of n okay so i can basically say this would be h of 0 this point over here would essentially be x of n minus 1 right and this is something that's important to keep in mind this block that i have drawn over here and marked it as this register right the way that we normally think about it is it is simply a flip flop or a set of flip flops connected with a clock and at every clock cycle the data passes through that flip flop from input to output yes this is a valid way of thinking about it but as far as we are concerned we are going to generalize that a bit further i don't really care whether it is one particular flip flop with a clock attached to it all that i really care about is whatever i see at the output of this register is the sample that was present one sample interval previously okay so i'm going to distinguish between sample interval and clock interval 
the reason i'm making this distinction will be clear later when we go a bit deeper into these implementations what i want you to sort of just keep in mind for the time being is the sample interval is something which is a true property of the system itself so for the case of audio when i said 48 kilo samples per second that 48 kilo samples per second is my sample rate okay i'll get 48000 samples of data does that mean that the clock which is used for my system is exactly 48 kilohertz not necessary i could work at a 1 megahertz clock a 100 megahertz clock anything i want as long as that 1 megahertz system basically wakes up 48000 times per second takes some data and copies it to another place it will still process the data at the correct rate although its internal clock is different from the sample rate okay so once we view it that way it becomes clear that this register that i have drawn over here is no longer necessarily a flip flop it could be but that's only one spe special case in general it is just something that is used in order to store the previous sample okay and the understanding that we associate with these registers is simply that every time i pass across a register at the output side i have one sample older than what was there on the input side okay with that in mind i can basically say okay now this needs to be multiplied by h1 this needs to be multiplied by h2 h3 and so on and then add it until i get y of n okay so it sort of becomes clear from this that what is ultimately going to happen right if i say that i want to have uh 30 tap filter at 48 kilo samples per second right will basically involve 30 multiplication operations 29 additions i'm just going to call it 30 additions right it that one over here does not really make any difference so roughly you know it's equal to the number of uh, it's close enough to the number of uh, multiplications that i'll just keep the same value in both cases right so these are the two main operations but there is also depending on how i have implemented it these x of n values could either be just sitting in registers or they might need to explicitly be read from a register and copied into a local variable somewhere inside my processor and then operated upon if i need to do that then basically the way that i have to think about it is now this involves reading and writing memory okay which means that 30x values to be read and 30h values also to be read okay now depending on your architecture you might be able to create something where the h values don't need to keep on coming from memory they might actually physically sit next to your multiplier but that is possible only if you have a separate hardware multiplier for each coefficient right if you are doing it with a programmable processor that's not going to happen which means that for every input sample i now need to read every single coefficient even though they are not changing i need to read it again from memory okay the x values again need to be read from memory if you look closely you might also think okay don't i need to also perform the shift operation that also requires some reading as well as writing the x values there are some tricks you can do or there to minimize the amount of reading and writing that you need to do so we'll ignore that for the time being basically you can use circular buffers or something like that to prevent going on reading and writing the x values okay so what this means is with this in place we can compute a few data points right going back to our questions over here estimate the bit rate 
the raw bit rate coming in from the sampling is essentially something like 48,000 samples per second into what we assumed was 16 bits per sample. which is basically what that comes down to is 16 into 48 is roughly around 800,000 800, bits per second. Okay. Now I want all of you to try and get into the habit of making approximate computations like this. Right? The number I have written here 800,000 is not accurate. It should be obvious that it is not accurate, right? Where did I get that number from? I wanted to multiply 16 into 48,000, but to me, it's a bit easier to multiply 16 into 50,000 because 16 into 5, I know what the result is, it's 80, okay? So then if I do 16 into 50,000, it turns out that I can get a better estimate, 800,000 bits per second, faster than if I try to do 16 into 48, okay? If you can do 16 into 48, fast that's perfectly fine just go ahead with the exact numbers but don't keep pulling out a calculator for these kind of computations that's not the point of what we are trying to do over here because at the end of the day i really don't care whether this is 800 kilobits per second or 750 kilobits per second all i care is it's not 10 megabits per second okay all right so that gives us an idea of at what rate we are getting data in from the outside world Okay. Why is this useful? may not be useful. It depends. It helps you to design your architecture. You have to have some part of the architecture that can handle this bit rate coming in from the A to D converter. All right. The number of multiply accumulates per second. So once again, for every sample that comes in, I need to perform the entire filtering operation. Okay. Which basically means that 48,000 times per second. I need to do 30 multiplies and adds. I'm going to call that a multiply accumulate operation. So once again, I have 48,000 into in this case 30, which gives me basically around 750. No, sorry. In this case, one and a half million, right? So 48 into 3, roughly 50 into 3, 150, right? So you get around one and a half million multiply accumulates per second. Okay. And what about the memory bandwidth? We see over here the number of data that need to be read, right? And from there, we basically come up with 48,000 times per second. I will need to read 60 words right where a word could be 8 bits 16 bits 32 bits depending on the number of bits that you are using in order to store your data of course x is in this case 16 bits i've already given you that the h values we don't know they could be 8 bits 16 bits 32 bits depending on the number format that you have chosen but I'm going to leave that aside and say it's just a memory read, right? In which case it basically gives us this number that this is going to be 3 million reads per second, right? And 3 million reads per second, assuming 16 bits is basically going to be 6 million bytes per second or 6 megabytes per second that needs to be read. Okay. So all that we have done is a very high level computation that just basically tells us, okay, look, this is the number of data points that I need to read. And therefore this is approximately the amount of data that I will need to fetch from memory in order to do my computation in real time. Okay. Keep that in mind. All of this is with that constraint that I want to do this in real time. I'm assuming that I am getting data at 48,000 samples per second. I am not trying to do this at the fastest rate possible. All that I care about is finishing it at 48,000 samples per second. Okay. 
All right. So that gives us one example of the kind of estimate uh, compute estimation that we can do. Right. The next one is from the domain of communications. It's basically the FFT operations used in the 5G radio standard. Right. So some of you may already be have heard some of the buzz around 5G. It's you know, obviously people want to you know they think that getting faster communications is a good thing or a useful thing. Whatever. You know, we know how to build this stuff, so let's go ahead and build it, right? So 4G or LTE, presumably many of you already have 4G phones. If any of you have a geo number, you basically have a 4G connection. That's already high data rate, right? Several megabits per second of throughput. 5G takes it one step further. The throughput is improved. The number of users it can be handled, etc., etc. A lot of improvements over there, right? Now. What I'm looking at is one very specific corner of the 5G standard, right? Because it's sort of useful to illustrate the kind of computation that comes into the picture over here, right? This is by no means even anywhere close to the total computation required for implementing a 5G system, right? But it can give you an idea of what are the difficulties that we are looking at. One of the things that we can see is it's a multi-carrier system which basically means that there are many uh, usually many different antennas okay occupying a hundred megahertz uh, bandwidth okay so we can basically expect a fairly high sampling rate on each input carrier frequency okay the it uses a combination of frequency division and time division multiplexing so the 5g nr radio frame essentially uses a combination of frequency domain and time domain multiplexing and you end up with a sort of grid out here which says this bandwidth or these blocks are available to different users okay Now, at the end of the day, as far as the implementation is concerned, we don't care too much about this part of it. What we are concerned with is what kind of computation does that mean for us? Okay. And what it comes down to is we have a time slot, which is about one millisecond within which we can have something like Fourteen symbols, right? Where the symbol is essentially one, what's called an OFDM symbol, right? For the present, all that we really care about is this symbol involves one inverse Fourier transform, typically of size four thousand ninety-six points. Okay, so just with that information, can we now go ahead and estimate what is the kind of computation that is required purely for performing these FFTs in real time? Okay, so what we are saying is, I have a 4K FFT, I have 14 of them per millisecond, implies 14,000 such FFTs per second, right? What is happening is the input data that's coming in at 100 mega samples per second is being broken into blocks pushed through the FFT and comes out at the other end. Okay, this will be some block of n elements and the FFT also takes n inputs and gives you n outputs. So with that in mind, the interesting thing that you can observe over here is rather than worrying about how many FFTs per second I need to compute and so on, you can always think of it as if I have some 100 million bits, 100 million samples coming in and they are being broken into blocks of N and then again reconverted into blocks of N and then coming out, the output also should be at what rate? The output of the FFT. What rate will I see over there? Hmm? Will it be more than 100 mega samples per second, less than 100 mega samples per second, 
equal no connection at all come on say something it should be equal right so essentially what we are saying is we have 100 mega samples per second coming in we are breaking it into blocks of n at a time doing some operation and once again serializing after that so i get the same data rate in practice of course you don't get exactly the same data rate the reason for the difference is that there is something called a cyclic prefix etc that's added we are ignoring all that for okay so the important point is when it comes down to that if i want to find out the number of multiply accumulates per second there are two ways i can do it either i can say how many multiply accumulates are required for one fft how many fft's are required per second and then multiply the two together i'll get the answer of course the other way of looking at it is i find out the number of multiply accumulates for one fft divide that by the number of samples and get the number of multiply accumulates per sample and multiply that by 100 mega samples per second and i'm done okay i'll get the same answer so either one will work okay and in this case one way of estimating it is the fft is supposed to have it says o of n log n operations right so we are going to assume actually n log n multiplications right in practice this is not exactly correct because there will be some you know either you can reduce the number of multiplication there will be some other factor that comes into it but this is close enough we are not going to bother too much about it so n log n when n is equal to 4096 this log by the way is log to base 2 so log n basically in this case is how much 12 so what i have is 4096 into 12 approximately 50000 mac operations per fft right or like i said 12 mac per sample okay which basically means that at 100 mega samples per second we are talking about 1.2 giga max per second and remember that you have many parallel streams over here right so i could potentially have 16 different carriers so i could be talking somewhere in the region of around 20 giga max per second or so is this a very large number or is it a, okay not so large number you need to understand what architectures are capable of to answer that question right which is what we are going to get to next the next one is a bit more involved it is something called it, it's an example of a neural network right for those of you who have done some reading on the background of image processing you would know that alexnet in 2012 was sort of the neural network that triggered the whole deep learning craze right essentially what it showed was that by using a deep network one with many layers you could get performance that completely outclassed any other approaches that were used for image processing to the extent that within a year or so all the traditional methods that were used for image recognition had basically been dropped and people had switched over to neural network based systems okay alexnet is a complex structure but it's nothing compared to what exists nowadays right the number of layers the number of different types of layers are like huge by comparison this is actually a very simple network okay this structure you can see over here already looks very complex all that it's saying basically is something like this you have an image which is actually something like a 224 pixels by 224 pixels by three colors okay and what you do is implement certain kinds of convolution operations on this okay a convolution operation can be thought of as you know you basically take a small square and impose it on top of this and do a point by point multiplication okay so this unit over here could be something like 11 cross 11 cross 
okay so 11 cross 11 cross 3 block of coefficients just put it onto your image onto one part of your image do a point by point dot product you get one number as the output okay take that number to your next stage okay so that is one of the elements in the next stage of your computation like that you create a whole set of different such operations and in fact you say I'm not just going to stop there I'm going to go further and create a further block of those okay so this could be something like 96 different elements okay so that essentially it was what it says over here the 224 cross 224 cross 3 the input image is put through 96 kernels of 11 cross 11 cross 3 with a stride of 4 right I'm not going to go into the details of this because it will just take too much time we'll get to this later and actually go through the calculations at one point but roughly what you can see is in order to compute one kernel right out here you can see that it involves 11 into 11 into 3 multiply multiply adds that is to compute one dot product one output over here the number of outputs is going to be that into in this case 55 into 55 because you are doing a stride of 4 etc and into 96 because there are 96 such outputs okay the bottom line is the kind of number of computations that you are going to be dealing with over here right the number of weights just in this first layer is approximately 35,000 or so right the number of computations is a few million right don't remember the exact number I think it's somewhere around 10 million or thereabouts okay I'm probably th this number is not accurate but you can estimate it it's basically 11 into 11 into 3 into 96 into 55 into 55 right you do the computation you will come up with a number over here okay but that's just the first layer after that you have four more such convolutional layers and then you have three so called fully connected layers a fully connected layer is literally as the name suggests you have n inputs m outputs n into m connections Okay. so the number of connections is large number of multiply adds is also correspondingly large okay once again bottom line that comes out over here is the total number of computations layer 1 is approximately around 10 million layer 2 is approximately somewhere around 100 million L3 L4 L5 all are in the region of 100 to 200 to 50 million or so right and in some cases because you need to do additional computations before you can reduce it uh, in fact it's more than 200 it probably goes to around uh, 800 900 million okay per layer so when you add all of this together we can see that the number that you come up with is somewhere around 1500 million multiply accumulate operations and at least the original AlexNet was just implemented using floating point computation because they were not very concerned about hardware implementation they just wanted to demonstrate that the recognition worked okay so this basically is the number of floating point operations another way of putting it is around one and a half giga flops okay note this is just operations not operations per second because I don't care about speed yet okay but you can see that you know the kind of computation that we are talking about over here the FFTs we were saying okay I needed 20 giga max per second here I don't care about per second I'm just telling you this is the number of operations I need to do in order to recognize one image now what's the best speed at which you can do it right so this is an example of an application where I do not have real-time constraints I am not concerned with this is the speed at which you need to recognize images you might at some point if you are actually putting it into a real-time video or something but let's say that you are just uploading data onto Google and Google is just using this to recognize faces they are not doing it in real time right they just do it as fast as they can possibly faster than real time okay so 
what this means is the number of parameters by the way is also something that you can estimate it turns out there are a few million around like 10 million parameters or so that need to be stored in order to implement all of AlexNet. Those parameters that I'm talking about are basically the weights on each of those uh, layers. The number of M flops we saw is somewhere around 1500 to 2000 somewhere in that range. Now we saw this number around let's say let's say 2000 okay 2 gigaflops okay so that's the estimate that we have got right now from our computation. There's one website over here where this person has basically gone and uh, done benchmarking of networks. This is a couple of years old, so it's basically they have data from 2016 and have estimated that there is one particular GPU, the NVIDIA Pascal Titan X, which is pretty much the top of the line as of that date, which was capable of a peak performance of 10 teraflops. Okay. And the time that he observed for running one instance of AlexNet, basically recognizing per image was approximately around 5 milliseconds or so. All right. So let's do the math. 10 teraflops peak into 5 milliseconds is 50 gigaflops, 50 billion floating point operations. Where did the remaining 48 go? Okay. Because what we are saying is one image on AlexNet should have taken us 2 gigaflops. The processor is capable of handling 10 teraflops. It took 5 milliseconds. Within 5 milliseconds, the peak performance could have been 50 gigaflops, 50 billion floating point operations. But we only recognized one image, which is 2 billion floating point operations. Okay. What happened to the rest? Okay. And this is one of the crucial things that we'll have to understand as we move forward. The answer, if you think about it, is fairly simple. This 10 is a peak number. Ideal situation. All numbers sitting in registers, all you are trying to do is load them into your ALU, multiply and write the result back into a register. If you keep on doing that, yes, you will get 10 teraflops of throughput. But AlexNet is not as simple as that. I need to read weights, I need to read data, I need to do some computation, I need to store it back into memory. Those memory accesses are not completely regular, they are highly regular but not absolutely regular. Therefore, there will be some latencies involved over there. But you can see the impact. Effectively, what I've got is I've had a 25x reduction in efficiency. From what could have been 50 gigaflops, I've dropped to 2 gigaflops of throughput effectively. Okay. All right. So let's get go into the with all of that in mind. Like I said, the purpose of that entire exercise was sort of to estimate the computational capability, uh, the requirements for a uh, few different uh, applications right but what we are going to do now is go a bit further into some architectures okay I may not be able to complete this today we will continue on the next class but again what the purpose over here is to sort of give you a flavor for how you can estimate certain numbers of architectures and whether a particular architecture is suitable for a given application first of all what are the computational units that are present in any architecture that you would need We'll assume that there is always an arithmetic and logic unit, some kind of an arithmetic and logic unit that you need in order to do computations, right? If it's not an explicit arithmetic and logic unit like you have in a processor, there is still something that does those kind of operations, okay? Almost any processor that you look at nowadays, not almost, any processor that you look at nowadays has to have an integer processing unit. But not all of them will have floating point coprocessors, okay? Why is that? We will understand that a little bit better when we look at floating point in more detail and in particular try to understand how it can be implemented in hardware. Okay. So especially what happens is several microcontrollers do not have floating point units. It turns out to be a drain on the power consumption. But on the other hand, there are other kinds of processors, typically DSPs and GPUs that have a number of specialized multiply accumulate units just for the purpose of fast multiply accumulate okay and then of course there is the sort of custom hardware architecture where you can go to the other extreme and say look i have separate hardware multipliers these are customizable i can use them any way that i want okay so these are the kind of computational units that we are going to be using in pretty much any architecture that we see what we are going to do now is just look at a few different examples over time of different kinds of 
processors and estimate their computational capabilities. Now, in order to understand that, right, the next thing that needs to be done is to keep in mind the clock frequency. The computational units are one part of the story. What kind of computations can be done? The clock frequency determines how fast you can do it. Okay? That's determined by the complexity of the hardware primarily, right? So for example, when we say that I have, you know, the latest Intel core processor running at 3.8 gigahertz or 4 gigahertz, somebody at Intel has sat, a whole team of engineers has sat and basically optimized the circuit architecture to the point where the register to register delay is less than 0.25 nanoseconds, right? So hopefully all of you got a chance to, were able to, you know, uh, work out the problem in yesterday's micro quiz about the timing, right? This is essentially what it comes down to, right? Every circuit at the end of the day is a set of gates and registers. And the kind of analysis that you did as part of the problem yesterday is essentially what is used in order to determine what is the clock frequency that can be used for a circuit, okay? So there is something called a critical path. There each flip-flop has a certain setup time, a hold time, a clock to output delay. All of those combine in order to determine what is the minimum value of the critical path length, critical delay, right? And that minimum value in turn sets the maximum clock frequency, okay? So it's always harder to run a system at a higher frequency because you might end up violating some timing some signal is doesn't have enough time to settle before it is going to be captured by the next flip flop okay so that critical path analysis is directly related to the complexity of the hardware it turns out that when we go for a complete asic the application specific integrated circuit very often we find that you are not going to find asics that run at 3 gigahertz 4 gigahertz and so on you might at most find something running at 1 or maybe 1.5 something like that, right? The two gigahertz plus range is almost exclusively seen only for processors, where people are spending that extra effort to optimize the ALUs. The reason for that is simple. When you're designing an ASIC, it does not necessarily make sense to go for that kind of high clock frequency. You're probably better off using some other form of parallelism or some way of improving the amount of computation that you can perform in a given time, right? Part of the reason for that is, the clock frequency is also directly proportional to the power consumed. Higher clock frequency, more power will be consumed. Not just that, you can also do something called overclocking, where you basically run something at a higher voltage and therefore at a higher frequency than what it is nominally rated for. Right? Great. It means that I can basically take my uh, uh, system which was capable of, you know, uh, two gigahertz and do something and running it, run it at three gigahertz, but the power consumption is going to go up even more dramatically at that point, right? So you need like fantastic cooling systems to even get such systems to operate, okay? The next one is the bus bandwidth, right? The data transfer is usually, again, I mentioned this briefly earlier. Most of the time you would see that, you know, we use certain kinds of serial buses in order to communicate data from point to point. The most common one is USB, the universal serial bus. Okay. So why serial buses? Why not parallel? Why not use like N wires and just transfer a huge amount of data at once? There are a lot of complicated reasons for that. One of them is the fact that when I have eight wires, let's say, that are taking data from A to B, I need to make sure all the wires are of the same length. I need to make sure they have exactly the same width, capacitance, etc. Because any modifications in those will result in a signal having a different delay on that wire as opposed to the wire next to it, okay? So it turns out that actually running a single wire or a single pair of wires at a very high frequency is more efficient than running a large set of wires, okay? But as far as we are concerned, there is this whole notion of bus bandwidth, which basically determines how much data I can pull into and out of the system in a given amount of time, okay? And it turns out that wide buses can transfer more bits per second, okay? I mentioned briefly that when you're talking about memory chips, you might have like 64 bits per 
sample etc the reason they can get away with that is because they are not transferring over la large distances you just have one memory chip you have the processor and they are just connected by a very short trace on a pcb okay so all of those basically start to figure in determining what uh, given architecture is capable of handling okay we'll stop here for now in the next class we'll get into a bit more detail on individual example architectures and then from there move on to more details of the implementations of those architectures all right uh yeah so that's it for today's class uh one quick note uh tomorrow's class will basically be an overview of uh, the test bench that will be used for the fft uh, assignment okay so the tas will basically be giving you a presentation on uh, how that uh, test bench is going to look and how you are expected to write your code uh, like I said, there are still some sort of teething difficulties over here. We need to get the forum, etc. in place. I'll be announcing the deadline for the assignment once that is done. So I'm going to be a bit more relaxed as far as the deadline for assignment one is concerned. But please keep in mind that from your point of view, it's very important you get it done as quickly as possible because it tells you whether you are in a position to actually handle this course or not. Okay, so please don't delay it any further, right? Get started with it, talk to the TAs, find out how it needs to be done as quickly as possible. The exact deadline, the procedure for submitting, all of that will be announced once the mailing list is operational, which should hopefully be by today or, uh, you know, uh, definitely by Monday. Okay. All right. Uh, 